Philippians of the Christian religion. Now I have a few simple admonitions for young and old. Never interfere in a boy and girl fight. Beware.
stepped in the abdominal wall and searched along the incision, dropping ashes from his cigarette. He thrust a red fist at her. And get me a new scalpel. This one's got no age to it. The doctor flattens against the wall. A patient slides off the operating table, spilling intestines across the floor. Sir, up I can be expected to work under such conditions. He swept instruments, cocaine, and morphine into his satchel and tilted out of the operating room. Doc, by the dawn's early light, Doc, the Ben Wayne pushes through a the rail and boards the first light boat. Y'all all right, he says, seating himself among the women. I'm the doctor. Consider <laughs> the impasse of a one God universe. He's all powerful as all knowing, can't go anywhere, but he's already everywhere. He can't do anything because he can do anything. His <laughs> universe is by definition, so he has to create friction, war, fear, and death to keep his dying show on the road. And the technician tells him, look, boss, we don't have enough energy left to fry an elderly woman in a flea bag hotel fire. Well, I'll have to start picking it. Sure, and leave the details to Joe. Look, from a real disaster, you get a pig of Oh, it's a different crowd. 
what's the difference? Well, it wasn't the old Milky Way crowd at all. Mm -hmm. were, uh, I felt as if they were there for something else. I don't know, I don't know what other things were on the program, boxing and this and that. <laughs> I, I felt as if they were waiting for something else, most of them. I understood you, uh, you'd given up writing. Well, I wouldn't say I'd given up writing at all. I was reading from something that I'd written quite recently. Mm -hmm. could, could you tell more about it? Well, that's the, uh, that was the um, book I'm writing on Jesus Christ and the Christ virus, the idea that you have one Christ is uh, enough for 2,000 years. Now all of a sudden we're going to have a million Christ by replication. Christ pattern. Everyone, everyone saying that I am the way. None comes the Father except through me. You're going to have total chaos. Obviously. What inspired you to write about Jesus Christ? It's important, uh, important subject. Who was it? Who was, who was his case officer? Obviously, Christ was an agent. He said, I am as nothing compared with he who sent me. Uh, that means that he's an agent sent by his case officer. Well, who was his case officer? What was his real uh, mission? For one thing, of course, to establish a monopoly on miracles so that uh, miracles henceforth could be performed only by authorized personnel, that is, church personnel. So the church has taken over the whole area of miracles, healing, magic, which under ordinary circumstances is a widely divided uh, function by magic men and uh, healers and whatnot. So the, uh, the concept of monopoly is inherent in the Christian message only one way, the way. It could be a quite a difficult subject for, especially for Holland, because of the idea that a lot of Dutch people think that the influence of Christianity is slowly fading away. I, I guess there's well, a big difference fading between that's fading to some considerable extent. Fading, but they're fading very slowly. Mm -hmm. But don't you think that uh, writing a book on Jesus Christ is uh, oh yeah, I have to find a useful word. Um, well, almost not necessary. No, I think it's very necessary. I don't think many people realize the extent to which this complete split between doctrine and practice is inherent in the Christian religion. Mm -hmm. And they either attack it from the materialistic point of view. Many say that there was no such person as Jesus Christ, and this is all a retroactive invention. Or the religious point of view, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing uh, in between at all. Nothing would take into account. Uh, you know, the question as to whether Jesus actually did these miracles. Of course he did, some of them. <coughs> Now, the Buddhists take a very dim view of miracles and healing. They say, if you can, don't. <clears throat> the first place, you're upsetting the whole uh, order, if there is any order, with incalculable long-range consequences. That's one thing. <clears throat> and often, the, uh, the healer or the miracle man is motivated by idiotic self-glorification, vanity, and it's the most malignant form. So, uh, and also, of course, any any uh, miracle man puts himself in great danger. <clears throat> if you can, don't. That's what the Buddhists say. <clears throat> and they can. They, they usually don't. <clears throat> Do you think that Christianity, uh, well, no, let me put it another way, that 
can you explain why Christianity is still so very much influential in the United States? Well, it's influential, influential worldwide. Well, um, not exactly. Uh, that is partly what I'm going to try to get at in the book. But um, one hold that it has, of course, is this uh, the, the gap between theory and practice. Actually, a Christian is not called upon to do anything but to change his way of thinking or acting in any way. And that appeals, that has a wide appeal. The fact that nothing is, nothing is expected of them except uh, surface, you know, except observing the uh, lip service to the uh, Christianity. You know, you have to pray all the time. I mean, the Muslims, they're supposed to pray five times a day. That takes up some time. Christians don't have to do anything except go to church on Sunday and not even that. Unless they feel like it. Can you see, um sort of line going through the newer novels, say from Cities of the Red Knights to uh, this book on Jesus Christ? Well, yes, I, the, of course the uh, Cities of the Red Knight and the um, Place of Dead Rose in the Western Lands are part of a trilogy. This uh, book on Christ is a, a sort of a side, mm -hmm. another, uh, another issue. Could you just explain something about the, the trilogy? Well, it's all the, uh, the same, uh, the same people, same characters carry over. Uh, we have the says the Red Knight consideration of this uh, virus and its effects, and then uh, the place of Dead Roads is an expansion of that uh, time travel and the Western land sort of concludes the trilogy, does conclude the trilogy. And bearing these things in mind, uh, when you're, you're talking about the book about Christ, uh, does it annoy you that most of the reviews of the Western lands are saying it's your last novel? No, no. It's the end of a trilogy. Well, no, they can say another novel, that's fine. He has many other things that maybe he might ask about. Maybe, but all right. Do you find even any humor in that at all? Pardon? Do you find any irony or humor even in that? No? <laughs> None, whatever. I think maybe a lot of people also thought that uh, the Western Lands would be your last book here because you're, you've taken up painting. Well, I... Uh, find that there's uh, so many ideas that I can express in painting that I can't express in writing. There are things you can do in painting, of course, you can't do in writing. Vice versa, there are things you can do in writing that you can't do in painting. No, uh, I think trying to make some possible, some synthesis of the two. And I was thinking of possibly of illustrations uh, the book on Christ. Well, maybe you should uh, tell something more about your painting because I have the impression that most people are not aware of this activity. Well, painting is, uh, uh, it isn't pop art, it doesn't, I don't think it falls into any, um, any of the artistic classifications. Uh, it's very much influenced by Brian Geisen, his calligraphy and the brushwork. There are also elements of uh, randomity that you find in um, that you find in Pollock and Eve Klein. That is the way in which the uh, in the um, <coughs> in the wood pieces I explode cans of spray paint with a shotgun. Then you've got an explosion of color. And then you get several colors forming uh, unpredictable patterns. 
you know, they, they used to let paint drip down the canvas. This is a much more extreme uh, form of rent only since it goes in all directions and it's quite unpredictable. There's no way to predict the patterns. Uh, or, uh, of course, then there's also the grain of the wood. I want wood that has the most grain and knots and that sort of thing. So the pieces are absolutely, you can say, they're absolutely, uh, um, what you call it, what do you call it, exclusive. They cannot be reproduced. It's impossible to reproduce uh, one of these uh, wood paintings with a shotgun glass and uh, paint uh, blasted across the surface in these random patterns. However, usually I do not leave it there. I may prepare the, can the uh, surface first with calligraphy or silhouettes in a number of different ways, or I may work it over afterwards. It's only occasionally that I look out and with a couple of shotgun blasts get something that doesn't need to be touched. You know, that doesn't happen very often. When it does, I'm lucky. Very important for a painter to know when to stop when the painting is finished. So sometimes I take one look and say, not another thing. Well, that's fine. Other times they aren't finished. There's a lot more that can be done. That's what, <clears throat> what you can have with writing as well. It's when you're overwrite. Uh, you can have as, as your own theory says. Yes, yes, it's but it's much well. more sensitive with painting because you can, if you overwrite, you can take it out. Mm -hmm. But once you get it in there, it's not so easy no, to take it out in painting. 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 And furthermore, in painting, it's much more delicate. There's a few words that doesn't make a difference. But in painting, one stroke of the brush too many can be disastrous. <clears throat> Did you find a necess necessity to make something um, it's impossible to copy. No, no, that's that's uh, that's not necessary. It just happens by the method, by the method of of, uh, of uh, producing the picture. It cannot be produced. Even the even the ones that are pure brushwork would be very difficult. Brian Geisen uh, once sent, said something in an interview about you, you've taken up uh, painting for maybe 25 years ago, 30 years ago. No, no, no. Uh, I didn't do anything uh, like I did. I did a great deal of uh, montage work, scrapbooks, and that sort of thing, but nothing that could be called, well, of course, you can call montage painting very definitely. Uh, like Rauschenberg, he's done a great deal of um, like montage mm -hmm. and photo collages and um, you know, juxtapositions of images and words and so on. But uh, what I'm doing now is, in many cases, a straight painting, which I had not done until I started really uh, about six years ago. Started with the shotgun pieces and then very rapidly went on to elaborate those and then on to uh, paper. Do you think you've uh, paid any contribution with your montage and collage work uh, to, uh, well, say, the current television uh, making? Well, television or any, anything that's occurring in the visual arts is, uh, <clears throat> draws data from all kinds of sources, and the whole montage method has been very much a source of, of data for many years, long before I did have anything to do with it. It's one of the uh, one of the early directions in which uh, art went when they turned away from representational art. 
Well, the difference between Dana and you could be that, uh, well, you spoke seriously about it or thought seriously about it. Well, well there, are, there, 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 are as number, well. there are a number of differences. Uh, Dada did not go very too far in the way of randomity. In fact, they avoided the area. So, it is very well possible that your influence on say television making is much bigger than most people's most people recognize well there's no it's uh, it's incalculable because there's so many other factors there's, uh, there's no way to, to say precisely uh, how it affects the television i'm sure a lot of television makers uh, must have read your books in uh, some of them. So some of them. Yeah. Well, do you know how you used your methods? Mm -hmm. Do you know how they used your methods? No, but the use uh, the use of cards is implicit in the in the medium. I mean, they, all right, they make a lot. Uh, so many hours of footage and they're going to use so much of it so the important thing is the editing cutting most important work in the film uh, I suppose the same is true of television is done in the cutting room <coughs> And the <laughs> flippant question. I remember reading in the past that you said you uh, you made yourself available for playing the role of the, the president of the United States should any film offers come up. And now I hear that uh, since Reagan is going out of office soon, he has said that um, he might possibly play himself once he leaves office. Do you feel uh, any resentment that he's taken away your? Oh no <laughs> no no! no. I played the president of the United States in a in a science fiction film in London, in England, years ago. Mm -hmm. Just a very brief, brief mm -hmm. No, I, I don't feel any deprivation. <laughs> mm -hmm. How do you uh, view going back to London? Going back to London, I'm going through London mm -hmm. on my way. I'm going, going there primarily for the show, mm -hmm. uh, which is on the 31st. Mm -hmm. uh, May the uh, show of, the act of, of my uh, painting at the October Gallery. Mm -hmm. Do you still enjoy uh, Britain? Uh, even though you didn't, you always say you never really enjoyed living in Britain. Do you actually enjoy visiting? Like well, I'm there for uh, for business mm -hmm. primarily. Mm -hmm. Has anybody approached you at all to um, say anything on the subject of Section 28, which is the new uh, legislation? Um, banning the promotion of homosexuality in education or the media at all? Yes, I heard, about it. I think David Hockney made a protest. I think he withdrew his painting from the uh, paint show. Mm -hmm. uh, no, nobody has said anything to me I still find surprising that your books mm -hmm. aren't. Still find surprising that your books aren't banned. Or some of your books aren't banned. Where? Uh, I find it surprising. Where? Those aren't banned. Where? In England. Uh, well, no, we've never had any trouble. Yeah. So. Well, the thing is, uh, they've been around so long. Clement and Mullins had the greatest, uh, one of the greatest uh, advantages that after pupils of writer could have is longevity. If he lives long enough, he's the grand old man of letters. <coughs> and therefore becomes uh, sort of a human banning. 
There's a subject you would like to talk about now. Like, listen, you think there's a subject you would like to talk about now? Well, uh, no, nothing, uh, uh, nothing uh, special unless you have some questions. Would you be prepared to um, uh, do some kind of um, special reading for the viewers of Robotnik TV? Uh, well, I. Uh, Repetition of the meeting that I did last night, the night before? Yeah, something like that. Or do you know something uh, um, by head? Not by no hand. Uh. Well, of course, the readings, uh, the meeting I did had nothing to do with the art. Mm -hmm. Now what I would like is um, some kind of um, direct um, uh, talk to uh, uh, the viewers of our uh, television program. Because as you know, uh, one of the um, f uh, first most impacts of television is uh, when people uh, speak directly to the viewers. Yes, well, uh, but, uh, on, on what subject? Any kind of subject. I see. I am going to give a talk on representational art, mm -hmm. modern art, and how the uh, representational art. Well, the, the whole idea, of the cut-up method, was uh, that it's closer to the facts of human perception. Life is a cutout. As soon as you look out the window or walk around the block, your consciousness is being cut by random factors. And uh, the idea of the painter or the writer producing in a timeless vacuum is, uh, is a fiction and it's time to dispense with it because it has nothing to do with reality. Life is a cutout. And that should certainly be reflected in both writing and painting, I feel. How the cut-ups introduced a random factor into writing, and then uh, there are many ways that you can introduce random, many more ways that you can introduce random factors into painting. Well, with a blast of a shotgun, or you can do this um, ink blot art, <coughs> putting uh, colors colors on a page, and then another page over there. But usually, you'll find that it requires additional work. As you make a ran random patterns and then you make uh, impose random order uh, by using uh, uh, silhouettes. If you don't have a random factor in painting or writing, it gets dead repetitious. <clears throat> Do you think the same uh, method applies to, um, for instance, making uh, films or television as well? Oh, even more so. Films have been, uh, been employing random factors for a long time. As soon as they get out of the studio, if they do any street shooting, naturally there are random factors. Some of the best effects would be accidents. <coughs> yes, it's, it's uh, actually this random has uh, been done for a long time in, in uh, film, in music, music of John Cage, in, Earl Brown. Uh, it's been used for a long time in music and uh, painting and also in, um, in film. But of course in, in painting or in writing <coughs> it isn't so much that the technique you use is the final result. Must be judged on uh, the, the object itself, the book, or the, uh, the painting. 
not on the on the way in which it was produced. Although Clay says that the way in which a work is produced is more important than the work itself, which would lead to uh, <coughs> Uh, presenting your palettes as the work of art and throwing the painting away, <coughs> but I find you can keep both. But I have gotten some very good effects see, on a piece of paper I've got here, to just to see if the ink is, uh, what the color of the ink is, and often by the time I'm finished, the, uh, the test paper is as interesting as the picture itself. <coughs> What would you say about um, the qualities of uh, uh, sound when you take all the, um, uh, the images away? Well, it's music. It's known as music. No, I'm referring to um, uh, a new experiment which will be uh, set up here in uh, Amsterdam. Mm. In the next month, uh, some kind of uh, sound cinema uh, where people have to lie down on mattresses and um, the whole room where the, the sound will be played uh, will be completely dark, so they can't see anything at all. And apart from that, they will be blindfolded to uh, even increase uh, this effect of being left completely uh, on their own. And just uh, the only thing they can, um, yeah, that which comes to them is, is this sound, which comes from about uh, 70 speakers, uh, which are uh, all around the room and by some kind of uh, ingenious uh, computer device it's possible to make the sound move as well. Yes, but sound, it sounds like music to me still, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah, it can be music, but... Uh, but Brian says the dream machine is the only, um, it's the only art form that you see with your eyes closed, mm -hmm. as you look into it with your eyes closed. But there, the, uh, your eyes, while they're closed, light, uh, light pulses are entering, the, uh, are entering your eyes. But here, there would be nothing of that sort, just the sound. Mm -hmm. right. It also sounds like a sensory deprivation chamber, <coughs> except for the sound. Yeah. Yeah, the idea is more or less um, to go into the direction of um, uh, the feelies from Brave New World. Has this been tried yet? <coughs> yeah, yeah, there have been some experiments. But what about the sound itself? What does it consist of? It can be anything. It can be um, uh, a musical uh, play which is specially composed for uh, this kind of uh, situations. And it, it could also be um, just like, well, some kind of random uh, mixing of different uh, sound uh, sources. For instance, we've, we've done um, uh, some radio programs over the last uh, few years here in Amsterdam, um, which was kind of... Um, uh, done in the same way, like uh, people would come in to the studio with uh, a, a set of uh, completely uh, different tapes, like odd tapes, and they would just um, uh, put uh, them into the machines and uh, do random mixing. And uh, finally some kind of pattern would em emerge, which uh, the people who were working at, uh, at, the, at the program um, were getting into. And um, it was very interesting to, to follow uh, as a listener as well, you know, because it, at first you have uh, this idea, what's going on here, you know, where some people are uh, doing, um, I don't know, some kind of crazy uh, job on a radio station, and gradually, if you keep listening, you get the idea that something is evolving. Huh? You are witnessing the... the um, the growth or the birth of uh, some kind of um, um, sound piece. Yes, but I mean, is there any consensus of experience here? Consensus? Consensus. There's a number of people hear this mm -hmm. uh, sound piece. Do they, uh, do they uh, feel any consensus 
as to what they're hearing. I mean, do they feel it? Do their patterns? Uh, I think it's a very in individual they, uh, experience. Oh, uh -huh. so they all hear something different. Mm hmm. But valid for them. I mean, it's an interest then. They mm. find it interesting. Yeah, yeah. As far as uh, reactions uh, have uh, shown so far. I think that you can get quite uh, pronounced reactions too by uh, fading different sounds into different, into the two ears. Mm -hmm. uh, going to different brain hemispheres. Yeah. How would you do that? Well, headphones. Mm -hmm. so. And make, make specially composed uh, pieces for uh, the one side of the brain and for the other side of the brain. Well, whatever. You're putting one thing into one side and one thing into mm -hmm. another. And uh, that apparently creates some quite extraordinary effects. <laughs> did you ever do experiments on that? I haven't, no. I've just read about it. You know about people who did so? I've read about it. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's an old me magazine. They also tried it on the eyes. Watching two different images. Two different images. One in one eye, one in the other. So I have a feeling that if you take a big room and you put about 100 people in there who listen to the same sound uh, sources, uh, that you're not only uh, hearing the sound of people, but also uh, the sound from the speakers, but also the sound of people around you. Oh, you yes. Certainly. In that sense, it's the difference between a sensory it's, uh, and Well, yes, the, it's the difference between one person and, and uh, more than one. Since you get more than one person and the sounds of breathing and all that sort of thing. And also, in sensory deprivation, sound is one of the, uh, uh, one of the main uh, factors or elements that they try to shut out. I think even more much hard, much harder to yeah. shut out the mic. Shut out the mm -hmm. sound here very good, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pretty quiet, yes. yes. Yeah. How do you feel in the big city? So as, as I understood, you're living very quietly. No, I'm living in a, in a small town, uh, 60,000, but it's only 30 miles from Kansas City, mm. so it's city and cities are no, no. <laughs> are no uh, big novelty to me. And I get to New York several times a year mm -hmm. and travel around. Amsterdam is still a small town for you. Do you know survival research laboratories? Pardon? Do you know survival research laboratories? I don't know. No. No, have you they ever they heard of it? Hmm? Did you ever heard of it? No, I never did. It's an American guy, Mark Polini, he builds this huge robots. Uh, no, I said, uh, what kind of research? Well, um... Electronic or what? Yeah, it's electronic. I thought you maybe. No, I really don't know. Because in the States he's quite famous, I think. Yeah, he built um, self self destruction machi machines. He built what? Self destruction machines. Very huge oh. ones. Oh, you mean, you mean Tingley? Hmm? Tingley? No, no. His name is Mark Pauline. Uh, oh, Mark Pauline. Of course I know Mark so, Pauline. Yeah. What do you think about. Uh, um, well, it's kind of funny. He does all sorts of interesting things. I shot his flamethrower. And uh, the flamethrower blew up once, and I think he lost uh, several fingers on one hand. Yeah. Oh, yes, I visited his, uh, his place there. It's, it's, it's amusing, fun. He had all sorts of machines that did all sorts of things. Yeah, we're organizing a big show for Emmy and Amsterdam uh, in July. Good. I haven't seen him in some years. He just did a show in New York last week. Really? Yeah. Because the man that started some of this self-destruct destruct machines was Tingley. It's 
Swiss. He set the Museum of Modern Art on fire with one of his machines. He had machines that would destruct themselves immediately and some that would destruct themselves over a period of years. So, when was this? I've never heard of Oh, Ching Lee, that's quite a while ago. That's 20, 30 years. But there have been uh, others. Deconstruction, I presume. <laughs> No idea what deconstruction is supposed to be in art. Still five minutes. It's very difficult. <laughs> Could you um, maybe say something about um, um, the the way you think uh, developments in uh, in art will be um, like? Uh, in the next few years of this century, if you like, if you look uh, back on um, the the years that you've been active in uh, in uh, writing and um, lately um, in painting, um, I think you could say something about uh, the state of the art uh, today and maybe a, a little bit about the state of the art tomorrow. Of the what? The state of the art tomorrow, uh, because lots of people. Well, what I'm doing is, is actually a fairly old-fashioned, uh, it ends in a painting. What I do in, in, in writing is old-fashioned and then it ends in a book. Uh, of course, there are all these happenings where uh, somebody uh, dumped down 20 tons of sugar on the ground. Now that was a, that was a happening. And these walls and all that sort of thing. Uh, Getting away, getting away from the can, the canvas. But if you get away from the can, canvas, you're getting away from your uh, your object, what you're selling. And I'm not doing that. So uh, even I, I think I can call myself rather old-fashioned you know, as far as art goes. Mm -hmm. If this uh, happiness, this um, happening tendency is the future of art. I don't know if it is. I think it's a self limiting phenomenon. Mm -hmm. well, what do you think of all these people who say that uh, everything has been done, uh, nothing uh, new can be uh, thought of, uh, this kind of, um, uh, how do you say, um, um, yeah. Postmodern. Oh, well, yeah. that, that's demonstrably untrue. Because every every uh, second is new. Because it uh, it brings into play factors that have never been in uh, in action before. Just by the fact of organic change. If uh, if nothing new was happening, everybody dropped dead immediately. <clears throat> Because life is by its nature, organic process is by its nature new, it's by its nature unpredictable and evolving, changing. So uh, this is not true, there's nothing new. So could, could we uh, say that you are an optimistic uh, person after all? Uh, that means nothing. Optimism or pessimism means nothing. It's just a, there are the facts, what is happening. On an international political scale, I see nothing to be optimistic about, but uh, those are sort of loaded, meaningless words, optimism and pessimism. No, it doesn't, you don't have to be optimistic to make a simple biological observation that life is by its nature unpredictable and changing. Do you still think the future is in space? If anywhere. Certainly doesn't seem to be much future here since they're busily destroying the resources of the planet, cutting down all the rainforests. So, um, really it seems to run itself into the ground. <coughs> Oh, 
don't know how far the army is now. I guess we just have to wait. Probably, uh, they don't really do, do anything until it's too late. According to Costo, the sea is about more than half dead already. Sad ending. <laughs> Could be a sad ending of the interview. Yeah, maybe you would like to uh, say something to the viewers of this program. <laughs> say what? <laughs> say something to the viewers of this program for uh, a final uh, final word. A final word. <laughs> well, I gave uh, advice for young and old uh, at the Roxy. <laughs> Which was. Never interfere in a boy and girl fight. Beware of whores who don't want money. If you are doing business with a religious son of a bitch, get it in writing because his word isn't worth the shit not for the good Lord telling telling him how to fuck you on the deal. I guess you have to take all that now. If after having been exposed to someone's presence, you feel as if you'd lost a quart of plasma, avoid that presence. You need it like you need pernicious anemia. Avoid fools, fuck-ups. Uh, you all know the type. Anything they touch turns into a disaster. Uh, boo is bad news and it rubs off. Don't let it rub off on you. There's some of my admonitions, advice. It's <clears throat> good. Okay, thank you. This is William Burroughs on Robotnik TV. This is William Burroughs on Robotnik TV.
Ausland zu Gast gewesen.